Here we go again. This module, we will be discussing inductive logic. Inductive logic is another form of logic that differs from deductive logic in that arguments that are inductive are based on probability rather than certainty. So if you remember from the last module, we were learning about how to support our thesis statement by creating arguments using uh, supporting reason, using premises uh, to force a conclusion to be true. And that's going to be slightly different when we use inductive logic. And inductive logic is the use of arguments when we're not necessarily suggesting that something is guaranteed absolutely certain, but instead that our conclusion is just probable based on our premises. So if you look at the argument on the left, Socrates is a man, all mortal, men are mortal, Socrates is mortal. This is a deductive argument because Socrates being mortal is guaranteed by the premises. In the second argument set on the right, the inductive set, we see that the conclusion that Socrates has dark hair is only probable based on the premises that Socrates is Greek and most Greeks have dark hair. Here we have another example of an inductive argument. We want to argue that John has been out drinking, and our reasons for believing that is that last time John missed work, he had been out drinking, and John is not at work today. Now, it doesn't guarantee us that John has been out drinking. He could be sick. He could have gotten a flat tire. There are other things that could have happened. However, if statistics have showed when John misses work, he's been drinking, then if he's not at work, it's probable that he has been out drinking based on how strong your first premise is, uh, how strong uh, you can reason that the probability is high that he had been out drinking, therefore uh, is a cause to why, he'll, why he will miss work. Now, when it comes to inductive arguments, they're much riskier than deductive arguments. And what I mean when I say that they're riskier is that when we use a deductive argument, we're guaranteeing our conclusion, which means that the person who's reading or listening to our argument will be convinced of the conclusion if we can prove the premises to be true. So when we're writing a paper, our job in each paragraph is to show that the premises are true. Therefore, the conclusion will have to be true. With inductive arguments, it's very similar. You're still working to prove your premises are true, but some of your premises, rather than being true, will be based on some sort of probability. And you'll want that probability to be as high as possible so that your conclusion will be probable. Similarly, inductive arguments are more amplitative rather than deductive, right? Deductive arguments take very general claims and from those general claims deduce something certain. Inductive arguments take something very specific and certain and from that amplify the perspective in order to grasp in the probability of something being the case. And so with inductive arguments, we can't necessarily assess them on just the argument structure alone. Uh, we'll talk about this idea in a little bit that inductive arguments are not valid the same way deductive arguments are, but instead you need background evidence with inductive arguments. There needs to be uh, statistical evidence. There needs to be um, evidence that points to a probability. And so when we look at inductive arguments, we're not measuring them based on validity and uh, soundness. Instead, we measure inductive arguments on their strength. If the argument is very probable, then it is said to be a strong argument. 
If it is not probable, then it is a weak argument. And we want strong arguments. And so if we're using inductive arguments in a paper, we want to make sure that we're proving our premises or showing why our premises are, are, are probable that way that when we get to the conclusion, the reader will believe that our conclusion is as strong and probable as humanly possible. Without good evidence, without good statistical evidence, the premises will just point to a weak conclusion and, and therefore it will not be a persuasive paper. So when you think about probability, when you think about inductive arguments, it's important that we understand just the basics of probability theory and that when we rank probabilities, we do so on a scale from zero to one. The closer we are to zero, the less probable something is. The closer we are to one, the more probable it is. Uh, this is why if you've ever watched baseball, for instance, uh, the uh, player's batting average is 0.312 or 0.256. Here we're saying that 20% uh, of the time or 30% of the time that player gets a hit. Now, while in terms of arguments, that wouldn't be a good probability, when it comes to baseball, having a, a 300 batting average or a 0 0.300 batting average, that would be very good for that sport. But when it comes to arguments, we wanna make sure that we have high probabilities uh, and, and, and the strength of the argument will uh, range depending on how high um, a good argument is from a not good argument. So for instance, if I'm trying to get you to believe that most Greeks have dark hair and Socrates is a Greek and that Socrates therefore has dark hair, I mean, probabilities, a good probability for something like that would be above 50%. If we're above 50%, then this is a strong argument. We can think that Socrates is uh, probably has dark hair and we could uh, feel good about the persuasion of that argument. Uh, other arguments, however, or, or based on other statistics, it might not be good. For instance, if I were to say something similar and say 60% uh, uh, or rather, let's say a, a condom is only 60 or 70% effective, that's not a good uh, probability. That would be a very low probability for something so very important. Instead, we would need a probability up in the very, very high 90s uh, in order to feel safe and comfortable with the use uh, of such a thing. And so the strength of your argument is going to depend on what it exactly it is that you're talking about. And so uh, here are three sets of, uh, here are three different types of probabilities. Uh, we're only gonna really discover the first, or we're only gonna talk about the first two, the probability of A or B and the probability of A and B. So disjunctive claims and conjunctive claims. The probability of A given B is gonna be an important aspect when it comes to inductive arguments but that will come into play more with the fallacies that we talk about in the next module. So when we use disjunctive claims, and disjunctive claims are claims that use the word or typically. When we use disjunctive claims, it's important to note that disjunctive claims strengthen a probability. So for instance, if I were to ask what is the probability of throwing a two or six on a six-sided dice, we would do the math and get one in three chance. Notice how one in three is better than the one in six of rolling a two or the one in six of rolling a six. So when we ask what is the probability of throwing a two or a six, we would get to add those probabilities and get a stronger percentage than the two. Uh, 
When we use conjunctive claims, like and claims, we see that the probability is lowered. So if I were to ask, what's the probability of throwing a two and then a six with a six-sided dice? When we do the math, we would actually multiply one-sixth and one-sixth to get one over 36. Here you'll see that the probability of doing both of these things is less of a probability than either one of them on their own. So when you use disjunctive or claims, you are strengthening your probabilities. When you are using conjunctive and claims, you are weakening your probabilities. This is important when we're writing and trying to make a case for why something is probable. Take, for instance, this ranking. If I were to ask you to rank the following statements in order of probability, what would you say is most probable to least probable based on the information at the top? It's important to note that the most probable would probably be number three. And the reason for three being the most probable is because we're making a, a simple singular claim about natural cereal. The only other single simple claim is number one, that Pia works in a coffee shop. There are more people, however, that eat cereal that work in coffee shops, so we would put three first and then one. After that, four would be the next probable because four includes a conjunction, an and. Seeing as we've already ranked Pia working in a coffee shop, it would have to be the case if we added any other simple proposition that it would be less probable than Pia working in a coffee shop. So if I said Pia works in a coffee shop and does yoga, that would have to be a worse probability than Pia working in a coffee shop alone. Similarly, number two would be the least probable because here we have three conjunctive claims that Pia eats natural cereal, that she works in a coffee shop and does yoga. Every time we use the and conjunction claim, we are increasing or we are decreasing the probability, making something less probable. So for instance, if I were to remove this top paragraph about Pia's life, I should still know how to rank the following statements based on the fact of just using simple uh, conjunctive claims versus simple claims, knowing that three uh, is, is something people eat cereal more so than work in coffee shops, and then four and two are conjunctive claims, so are automatically going to be less probable. Now, it's important to note that when we're using inductive claims, we need to be careful about independence. And so when we're using two probabilities, they're said to be independent if one another is not conditional upon the other. So for instance, if I were to be playing roulette, roulette is a game in which each spin of the table is independent of the spin before it. This means that each time the table gets spun or the wheel is spun, I have the same odds of landing on red or black. A game that is dependent would be blackjack. Blackjack is dependent because my chances of winning are dependent on what cards the dealer is getting and other people at the table are getting because there are only so many cards in a deck. That way I can have different probabilities based on what other people are doing instead of with roulette having a reset of probability every single time the table is spun.
Here's another example of that. If we think of something like the World Cup, uh, if a team in the World Cup has a, a certain chance of getting through the first round, that probability is not just dependent on how that team does, but it's dependent on the other teams within the group. This means that we can't be confident necessarily that the probability of one team getting through or another team getting through is set based on solely what they do. We have other probabilities to take into account, meaning that the chance of a team getting through is dependent on other teams and what they are doing. In addition to conjunctive and disjunctive, uh, disjunctive probabilities, it's important to note just basic terminology when we're using inductive arguments. Remember, inductive arguments are amplitude, meaning that we talk about often populations and samples and referencing from sample to population and from population to sample. For instance, if I have a hundred apples in a barrel and 60 of the hundred are rotten, then out of 10 apples sampled, six should be rotten. So I can take a sample and make reference to a population or I can take 60, or I could know that 60 out of the 100 apples are rotten and therefore go from population to sample. In either instance, we are making inductive reference. Now, inductive reference can go wrong in two ways. Either the sample that we take is too small and therefore not representative enough, or the sample is unrepresentative and therefore doesn't take into account the diversity within the population. Using the law of large numbers, we can make sure that our sample is of a number that is representative enough. For instance, as a sample grows, the mean value converges on the expected mean value. For instance, let's say I conduct an experiment where 100 students participate. 10 of the 100 toss a coin 10 times, 10 toss it 20 times, 10 toss a coin 30 times, and then 10, 40, 50, 60, up to 100. The breakdown of probability of landing on heads and tails would look something like this. Here you can see, based on this graph, that the more times you flip a coin, the more likely you are to reach the mean value of 50% heads and 50% tails. If you're only flipping a coin a couple times, there's more chance for there to be outliers and for those outliers to affect the outcome of what the probability of flipping a coin is. Now we know that flipping a coin should be 50% heads, 50% tails, and the more we do it, the more we will converge on that number. This means that when we refer to samples, it's important that we have enough samples to really represent the, uh, the mean value. This is why, for instance, casinos may end up down at the end of any one day, but over a long period of time, they will end up. The highest percentage game in, uh, the highest percentage gambling game is roulette at roughly 46, 47 percent. You can bet on red, black, and you typically have the one green spot, meaning that you have a 46, 47, 48 percent chance of winning. But the longer you play, the more 
you will win 48% of the time and the house will win 52% of the time, meaning that in the end, the house wins. We can see another example of this by the Galton's ox example. And this is an example of when in 1906, a scientist averaged the answers in a guess the weight of the ox competition. If you've ever been to a fair, and at the fair, there was a game where someone was guessing the weight of an object. Rather than just guessing the weight based on how something looks, if we were to average out every single guess that was made in a day and average those guesses out, chances are we would be much closer to the actual weight of the object because the outlier guesses would cancel one another out and we would end up averaging on what the object actually weighed. So in Galton's experiment, 787 people made guesses and the average was 1,197 pounds. The ox actual weight was one pound heavier, which shows that you want to take the greatest sample number as possible because the larger the sample, the more you will converge on the mean. This implication is played out when we take polls or surveys. If I were to poll 200 people about who would win the next election, this may not be large enough to represent the entirety of the 300 million people living in this country. The ideal sample size depending on what's going on, depends on several factors, including size of the population you are testing and the margin of error you're prepared to accept. If we're dealing with votes in a presidential campaign and you have 300 million people in the country, you would want a very large sample size. Simple, similarly, you would wanna make sure your margin of error is very small because getting right the probability is very important. The other way that samples can go wrong is having an unrepresentative sample. So samples are not only, uh, not only can be too small, but also systematically biased. So in, to ensure that a, a sample is representative, the sample should usually be random and randomness is a difficult empirical problem to, to really solve. This is why when we have psychological studies, we often conduct double blind studies, meaning that the person who's conducting the experiment is also unaware of what is being uh, looked at, so their bias cannot play into how the uh, experiment is being conducted. Now the problem with induction occurs that events from the past don't always relate to future predictions. And so when we try to make predictions, we make them based on information in the past, hoping that the past resembles the future. But it's not always the case that this is true. For instance, if I had only ever observed white swans, then I may be led to think that all swans are white. The problem, however, is that if I were to never visit somewhere like Australia, then I may not know that swans in Australia can be black. And therefore, my research based on the past wouldn't necessarily create good predictions because past events don't always resemble what is to come in the future. Induction is difficult because of the probability aspect. It's useful when trying to be persuasive, 
because for most arguments, we're not able to create a certainty in terms of a conclusion. Therefore, when we're arguing for a particular thesis statement, it may be the case that the argument is subjective in a way where we can't necessarily guarantee our conclusion. Instead, we would want to simply argue that our conclusion is the most probable and therefore should be believed. This way, we argue for the probability of something and want our thesis statement to be as probable and strong as possible.